Good afternoon and welcome once again to a weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Virgili, Hispanic Public Information Officer. Thank you for joining us today. And with us today as guests are Dr. James Bridgers, who is the Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Program Administrator, Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response for the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief, Administrative Officer, and we have three additional guests today. Joining us is Maryland State Delegate, Bonnie Collison, good afternoon, Delegate, as well as Anita Basalo, who is the Director for Montgomery County Public Libraries, and Mitsuko Herrera, Montgomery Connects Program Director. Members of the media, remember to use uh, to raise your hands during the Q&A portions of this presentation. And uh, with that, good afternoon to you, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, during last week's media briefing, I was asked about the transfer of ownership at the landing, a memory care facility in uh, Silver Spring that's been operated by a company called Leisure Care since it opened in 2019. The new owners of this facility are Omega Healthcare Investors and Communicare. These companies intend to close the facility for a year-long renovation and then reopen it as a higher-level skilled nursing facility. What is appalling about this deal is that 53 memory care patients and their families were only given 45 days to find new accommodations. This is inhumane. And state law only requires 45 days, but the company could have and should have given these people more time. There was absolutely no urgency for them to shut this down in 45 days. Uh, as anyone who's dealt with memory care patients knows, moving and changing locations can be traumatic and confusing, let alone when it's done in such a short timetable. As we mentioned last week, our county's HHS long-term care ombudsperson um, are working with the impacted patients and families. And we have Dr. Patrice McGee, our acting chief of aging and disability services on our call today for any questions you may have about the current situation at the landing. Well, Dr. McGee and her team are paying attention to the immediate needs of the patients and families. It's abundantly clear. We also need legislative action on this 45 days notice provision at the state level. In my opinion, and I'm not the only one who thinks this way, notification window should be at least 90 days. And it's too bad the legislation is required to make companies do the right thing. But if that's what's needed, then we need to do it. So I'm pleased to read that this situation has caught the attention of Delegate Sandy Rosenberg, who runs the House of Delegates Subcommittee on Long-Term Care in Maryland. De Delegate Rosenberg said that 45 day days notice shocks the conscience. And we're grateful that he has urged the new owners to consider offering impacted families more than in the minimum required by the state. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Delegate Bonnie Collison into this discussion. She represents District 19, and she's the vice chair of the Health and Government Operations Committee, which oversees health facilities. So I appreciate her taking the time for us this afternoon and grateful for all she does to advocate for better health care for Marylanders. I was just with Delegate Collison a few weeks ago at Leisure World as we updated the community on the state's Prescription Drug Affordability Board, which we hope to expand this upcoming session as well. So Delegate Collison, it's yours. Thank you very much, Mr. County Executive. Um, and I want to, to thank you for laying out the, the issue so clearly. Um, and it is, it is an, is an issue, absolutely. It's something, you know, sometimes we realize uh, when issues, when things, challenges like this um, arise, that we need new policy, that our policy does not work. It's not usual for, an, um, for a facility to close down completely. And so it's it's rare that an entire population out of a facility would be moved. And in fact, there are residence agreements in each of our facilities that talk about what it, um, what is required under in that facility, um, um, including the and meeting the needs of the state regulations, which um, is as you've mentioned, the forty five days. Um, but it could be longer. It could, you know, 
and according to the resident agreement and there could be conditions under which it has to be done. And, but the regulations around what has to be included in the resident agreements is not specific enough to meet the needs of this situation. And for and what we're learning from this situation is we need a few more guardrails in order to make sure that these um, uh, residents are cared for and are make and have the facilities available to them that they can afford as they are being required to move. I know that as we are speaking right now, the oversight committee of the for quality care in nursing homes and assisted livings is discussing this issue exactly. I fully expect there to be legislation to extend the um, the the period of time that residents have to move. Um, I think you know uh, Delegate Rosenberg is fully supportive of that, and as the ch um, chair of that subcommittee, um, I would not be surprised if he if he sponsored that bill. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, and I apologize to the families that are now being displaced and are having to ch um, the, are challenged because the laws don't meet the needs right now. But I um, can affirmatively say that the legislature will be looking at this in the 2024 session and make some improvements. Thank you, Delegate Collison. And I, I appreciate working with you and the, and the work you're going to do. I, I will say that I hope when these guys come up for licensing, that the licensing board takes into consideration their treatment of these patients and determining whether or not to grant them a license. Because if this is how they treat people, do you really want them doing more treatment in the county for you know even more severe needs? So I think that uh, what they do ought to be considered in deciding what else they should be allowed to do here. Uh, but again, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to the coming session and the great things we're going to be able to move forward. Uh, thank, thank you, County Executive. Thank you, uh, uh, Delegate Collison. Members um, of the media, if you have any questions right now regarding uh, the landing, uh, Heather Curtis, there you are, WMAL Radio. Good afternoon. Questions regarding the landing. Good afternoon. I'm wondering at this point, do we know how many of the patients at the landing have found new places to live? And is there anything else that the county has been doing, aside from working with the state to change the law, to help these people? I don't know. I don't know an updated number. Right yes, now. good afternoon. I can answer that kind of okay. Good. Um, and so uh, the long-term care and busing program, which is a federally mandated program that uh, is provided oversight from the state ombudsman's office, the position in the Maryland Department of Aging, um, oversees the local uh, efforts on the on the local level. So our local ombudsman team has, even before the notification has been in this facility, uh, the local ombudsman serve as, uh, as advocates for residents and, 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 and providing them with information about their rights. Um, and they are there to support the residents and hold their hands through all processes while they're living in long-term care settings. Uh, so our ombudsman team has been mobilized. They were in the facility the day that residents received uh, this announcement. Um, and it is important to note that it is, um, we work on behalf of the resident. The ombudsman program works on behalf of the resident. The resident and the family must contact the ombudsman program and we can be involved in any meetings, um, any information in regards to this closure and we are there to mitigate any transfer trauma as they move into their new facilities. Um, so with that, we did receive our current census. They, uh, we are, there are 53 families in total, 45 of which had decided on where to relocate and eight are still deciding. Uh, we were notified and as well as residents were notified that during the week of October 2nd and October 9th, uh, the landing uh, would be providing community sessions about relocation information. So, and in addition, the landing is also required to provide a census, a daily census report to the Office of Healthcare Quality, which is the licensure oversight um, for nursing homes and assisted livings uh, here in Maryland. So uh, we are working and in, in, in tandem with uh, OHCQ, our state ombudsman's office, 
uh, and the local program to make sure that we are, are meeting um, the, the needs of our residents from the advocacy uh, position in which we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Members of the media, any other questions uh, for the state delegate and or the county executive regarding the landing? No more questions regarding this topic? Thank you, delegate, for joining us today. You can remain uh, on this call or you can jump off if you need to go. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, so we have some other great news to share uh, regarding reference to close the digital divide in Montgomery County. Over the last year, our county has been spearheading efforts to get more computers into the hands of children and adults who need them. I'm proud to announce we recently received $23 million in grants from the federal government to purchase 60,000 Dell Chromebooks laptops for residents who do not have a computer. Last week, I transmitted a supplemental budget appropriation to the county council so we can move forward and purchase these computers. Funding for these computers comes from the Federal Communications Commission's Emergency Connectivity Fund. And it's a grant that was secured by the Montgomery County Department of Technology and Enterprise Business Solutions, known by the simpler acronym TEBS, and the uh, Montgomery County Public Libraries. And I want to thank David Trone, Congressman David Trone, for his letter of support, and thank all of our congressional delegation as well for supporting our efforts to get this funding. This new computer distribution program is expected to launch next month. Eligibility for the program is limited to Montgomery County Library patrons with the Montgomery County Public Libraries card. After we distribute these 60,000 computers, Montgomery County will have provided a total of 119,000 computers in this county. That number almost matches the estimated 125,000 low-income families who do not have a computer. Uh, computer and internet access are key equity issues of the computers we've distributed so far. 85% went to households earning less than $50,000 and 74% of the computers went to black or Latino families and black and Latino families are nearly twice as likely uh, as other groups not to have a computer. While the need out there continues to exist, this computer distribution will have a large impact and as a result the vast majority of low income families in our county will have digital access for things like homework, for remote work, or just to help find the job. And it's a way of helping end the poverty cycle and it doesn't require anything but a library card. And that's pretty incredible. And I'm really happy this county is a part of this program. Securing this money and putting it to the work for Montgomery County families is a crucial step in creating opportunities. And I believe it's our responsibility to ensure that everyone in our community has a right to success in the digital age. And the di digi digital connectivity is becoming and has become as essential as a telephone or access to water and food. It is uh, the lifeline for many people and it's the way people work, it's the way people learn. And we cannot afford to have part of the community that has digital access and a part of the community that does not. Uh, last month, I was on a video meeting with Governor Westmore ahead of the launch of Maryland Digital Equity Coalition, the new statewide initiative aimed at making sure that every person in Maryland has online connectivity. And I agree with the comments Governor Moore made during his meeting when he said that access to the in internet is everything. It is water. And that is the truth. It is everything. Today I'm joined by Anita Vasallo, Director of Montgomery County Public Libraries, and Mitsuko Mitzi Herrera, uh, Director of Montgomery Connects Program. And Anita will talk about distribution plans for these computers and Mitzi will talk about our extensive efforts across multiple campaigns to get computers into more homes across Montgomery County. So I'm going to turn it over now to Anita and Mitzi for more details, then we'll take some questions. Thank you, County Executive. Um, the distribution of the computers uh, can be located on the Montgomery Connects uh, webpage. I believe there's a link from the library webpage. There are quite a few um, slots coming up over the next few months, and people can reserve a spot online. They can also call one of the libraries for assistance if they need help in navigating that. Um, one of the strategic goals of our four uh, goals in our new plan is 
that residents with limited access to technology and the internet can navigate the digital world. And so libraries in partnership with TEBS knows the critical importance, as you mentioned, County Executive, of access to the digital world for all of our residents. In addition to the um, distribution program that we're involved with, of course, the libraries have resources for all residents that will help them learn how to navigate this world, one of which is a, a online program called North Star Digital Literacy, which allows people to improve their computer skills, their software skills, and using technology in daily life, of course, all free with a library card. And also we have programs in uh, partnership with TEBS offered by Senior Planet that help our older uh, residents understand uh, the wide variety of opportunities and pitfalls that can uh, occur through internet use. And of course, um, just the, the basic availability of this to all of our residents is one of the reasons why libraries are so thrilled to be participating in this extremely important initiative in the county. Hello, thank you, County Executive. Um, and I'll just follow up briefly with what Anita uh, remarked there. This program is expected to launch in November. We are currently in the midst of an existing program to distribute state provided Maryland connected devices. And we are working with nonprofits to provide a supply of those computers so that they can distribute directly to their um, members. And anybody who's interested in that should contact us at Montgomery Connects at montgomerycountymd.gov. The uh, computer program, um, residents will need to uh, have a Montgomery County library card. They can go ahead and apply for that card now, either online or they can go into any library and physically get that card. They'll need the card number um, in order to um, register to pick up a computer. We anticipate that again, that we will start to have those dates on our website, which is montgomerycountymd.gov forward slash computer. Um, and those dates we should um, start to put up probably closer to the end of this month, the beginning of November. The um, other um, piece that I would just add on is that a big part of what we are trying to do is to connect the um, 55,000 people who have already received computers and the new 60,000 people that will receive it under the new program. We want to connect them to the training resources. Um, as Director Vasalo mentioned, we operate um, in partnership with OATS and AARP, the Senior Planet Program. Last year, we provided nearly 4,000 participants and we graduated 200 seniors from our multi-week classes. Um, our goal is that when people pick up the computers that they can have access to learn how to use them. And those are everything from basics to how to protect your information online, how to get access to healthcare information, monthly budgeting, social media, and so forth. Um, we are looking to, in partnership with our Department of Health and Human Services, we will be um, launching programs and distributions that are available at about 50 senior buildings in the county. And what we are trying to do is to, and part of what we want people to do is, because they have that library card and they have that access, is we want them to um, understand better all of the amazing free resources that are available at the library, um, both through the North Star program, you can get the LinkedIn training. Um, there are other um, providers throughout the county. There are a lot of um, youth, um, like Community Build, um, Club 480, um, all of our Up County Hub um, locations, uh, the Up County Hub and other um, hub locations that are offering um, training. Um, this Recreation Department also offers things. So that's going to be a big part of what we're doing is helping to connect people with those resources that are available. Lastly, I would mention is that the um, state of Maryland has provided money to the University of Maryland Extension to operate the Marylanders online. And um, there's information we can provide later. They have a toll-free hotline that's available in English and Spanish that people can help to find resources and programs in their area. They can get help creating an email account. They can get help registering for any of these um, programs as well. Thank you, Dr. Herrera, Herrera and Basalo. Uh, members of the media, any questions uh, for any of the directors regarding the new computer program, please raise your hand. This is the time for questions regarding this topic. 
questions regarding the computer program? I guess we don't have any. Thank you, uh, Director Vasallo, for joining us and uh, Director Herrera for uh, also joining us. Mr. County Executive. So other things and less happy things. Uh, you know, we've all watched the kind of horrific attacks that took place in Israel and the breaking out of another war in the Middle East. And there's obvious concern in, you know, our religious communities that hostilities against their communities could impact them here in Montgomery County. And unfortunately, even before this, we've been seeing a rise in, in crimes intended to hurt specific communities in Montgomery County since the start of the pandemic. We've seen Asian American groups um, experiencing a sharp rise in attacks and confrontations. We've seen a return of anti-Semitic messaging popping up in our schools and in our neighborhoods. Historic black churches like Scotland AME have been vandalized and Islamoph Islamophobia continues to persist throughout our county. Um, it is certainly not what most of us do. It is not characteristic of you know, most people in Montgomery County. But there's certainly a presence here and you know we acknowledge it and you know we're committed to doing everything we can to keep everybody safe the montgomery county police department's committed to documenting every allegation of a hate crime or bias incident and mcpd's community engagement division monitors and tracks all hate bias events in montgomery county it shares that information in a monthly report that can be found on the mcpd website and one thing those reports show us is that hate impacts more than just one group and stopping the groups behind targeted incidents and spreading these messages makes our community better. And we're committed to doing this work. Montgomery County is the only jurisdiction in the state and region that's committing its own funds to helping community groups feel safer where they gather and worship through our nonprofit security grant program and applications for these funds are now open and nonprofit organization and houses of worship have until Friday, November 10th to apply for these funds and groups can request up to $20,000 per facility if the money is used in the next year. The total of $900,000 is available in the grant program and an informational session is gonna be held to answer questions about the grant opportunity and that's scheduled for Wednesday, October 18th. In addition, I am going to be requesting some additional funds for immediate access to some of our religious institutions who are feeling at risk um, in this moment um, from possible attacks. Um, we want to make sure that we, we act <laughs> um, prospectively rather than reflexively and try to ensure that um, people are safe and secure wherever they are in Montgomery County. It is uh, a sad situation that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, speaking personally, the horror of the taxes, um, yeah, I can't even think of other things that equate with what happened um, in Israeli communities. And uh, it's just horrifying and it mystifies me how people can do some of the things that were done. It's just, you would hope that human beings weren't capable of that, but apparently that's a mistaken notion. Um, other news, um, our COVID rates are currently declining and our county's hospitalization rates have stabilized. And good news on this front has been welcomed. The new booster is becoming easier to find and we need folks to take this shot. And as you can see from this chart, our vaccine numbers have plummeted in terms of adoption between the first two shots in 2021 and 2022 and the more recent bivalent booster shots. And uh, Although we're still vastly outperforming the national averages, we've actually dropped off pretty significantly. The new booster is different from the previous booster, and it's designed to address the latest variants of COVID. You don't need to go and get a bivalent booster. They're no longer available, but you should get the new boosters. The protection provided by our earlier shots um, as we move into winter and more indoor activities, um, that protection is waning. That's the nature of a vaccine. And we're going to find ourselves in more risky situations. And I personally have seen more people contract COVID. Um, I've you know, been in meetings that were canceled because somebody had COVID. 
I know that Roundhouse had an experience. They had to perform, they had to cancel performances because their actors contracted more than one case of COVID. So this is out there and this is real. It's still dangerous, and uh, we want everybody to get vaccinated and prepare for the winter. Additionally, for anybody who avoided COVID shots over the concern over the mRNA vaccines, and I know there are people out there who. You know, that was their rationale for not getting shots. You need to know there's a new vaccine for Novavax that's manufactured in the old fashioned way. Traditional vaccines have been made and that's gonna be available very shortly. And they're already shipping um, and they're prepared to get this into the market as quickly as the final steps um, for that are, are taken by the federal government, but uh, it should happen very shortly. It was noted to me this week that we're currently seeing higher rates of people getting their flu shots than their COVID vaccines. The flu and COVID are both very serious illness that can lead to death. And both of these shots are equally important. Um, I would say the COVID shot is probably even more important, um, but certainly the flu shot's important. And as well as the new RSV vaccine for older adults and the immunocompromised. So there are three vaccines out there people should be getting and uh, Hopefully, uh, we'll not see the kind of rise in numbers that we would anticipate if people don't get vaccinated. So I'm going to stop there and um, open this up for questions from the media. Actually, I'm going to stop there and turn it over for, to my health team to do their end of the report, and then we'll go to the media. Uh, thank you, Mr. County Executive. I I'll try to take you through this uh, relatively quickly. I, I know our county executive has hit the, the high points. Uh, just sharing, I think some of the graphics came up a little bit late on that, um, but to, to his point, uh, we have now data for the, the previous calendar uh, or the previous year uh, flu season. And, and we see that a little bit less than um, half of our population have got the flu shot. Um, that rate's a little bit higher than the, the rates you see over on the right, the solid uh, bars being our, our county residents. Um, the solid bars on the left were the initial vaccinations. As you know, the CDC caps that reporting at 95%. The, the lighter um, uh, bars are the US population. So while our, while our residents got vaccinated at a lower rate with the bivalent booster than the original shots, um, you can see they're still roughly uh, double the the vaccination rate of the of the US population. Um, of course, this is also showing that on average, it's a little bit less uh, uh, residents getting the, the COVID shot than the, the flu shot. Um, and we'd like to see both of those numbers higher. Um, uh, of course, for our, our seniors, it's encouraging that a higher percentage of them are getting the shots, but um, it is recommended for everyone six months and older. Uh, going into our um, our case rates, uh, they continue to de decline uh, week over week over the last few weeks. Our hospitalizations have held steady now for a few weeks. Uh, looking at our wastewater surveillance, we have seen um, some decreases in the last week's worth of data uh, that would correspond to the, the lowering case rates. Uh, test positivity continues to come down uh, a bit by bit uh, over the weeks. This is across the state. And you can see I've circled Montgomery County's uh, positivity data. And again, across the state, uh, many counties are seeing the, the transmissions um, come down over the last few weeks. Uh, looking at the hospital numbers uh, across the state, you can see there's, um, again, similar to our county, it's held roughly the same. It's gone down just a little bit across the state. And our, our emergency department um, discharge diagnoses, people go to the emergency department um, and are treated in an outpatient capacity. Uh, you can see across the top for COVID, many of the age ranges have come down. We're still seeing some activity with our 65 plus uh, visiting the emergency departments. Um, uh, but uh, oh, Overall, across all ages, it, we have seen a decline. It's still elevated compared to earlier in the year. Uh, we are looking at uh, influenza and RSV in our county. We're just seeing a little bit of activity there, as you can see across the bottom. Uh, overall, ED volume has been just a little bit busier this past week. 
And then looking at the death data that just came in, uh, you can see on the far right, uh, uh, we're still in, in October, but uh, for, for September, across the state of Maryland, there were 86 deaths with a COVID diagnosis. That is um, fewer than half of what we saw the same time last year. Uh, so while there have been lots of transmissions going on uh, this summer, it's been it's been milder um, with relation to severe illness and death. Uh, looking across the U.S. to give an idea of 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 what's going on with all of the uh, respiratory diseases, you can see across um, all age ranges across the U.S. The co this is a COVID nineteen um, emergency department discharge diagnoses. So those are coming down from a high point in mid August. Um, they're they're coming down across all age groups. Uh, looking at RSV activity across the U.S., you can see uh, there's starting to be some activity. Um, as a percentage of ED visits, uh, the, the youngest children are the ones who are being uh, brought in. Uh, we know RSV uh, disproportionately affects our, our, the children, although over one year of age, it's generally a milder illness. Uh, but parents with um, newborns, if they're experiencing respiratory disease, please talk with your healthcare provider um, uh, to rule out some something serious such as RSV. Uh, for influenza, again, across all ages, we have not yet seen um, uh, significant uh, uh, activity across the US, um, but that is likely, we're, we're starting to just get into flu season now. Again, why we're encouraging people to get those shots before, uh, before the transmissions um, really kick up. And then just reminding folks, uh, lots of places in the county where you can get uh, rapid test kits or masks, um, both sending away to the federal, um, making requests to the federal uh, distribution by mail um, and looking for vaccinations. Again, we recommend contacting your um, personal health care provider who may not be listed in vaccines.gov to see if they have the vaccine. Um, if, they, if they do not, they'll often uh, be able to look at your insurance and let you know who's who's covering the costs for you. Um, all the major uh, insurers, uh, uh, federal insurers such as um, Medicaid, Medicare, um, CHIP, they, they're covering the cost of the vaccination at no out-of-pocket costs. And um, most most insurers should be covering it. It's just taken a little while. I, I, we've heard uh, some people or some doctors uh, say they're still working out uh, what the reimbursement will be with the insurance companies. But we, we hope that uh, they soon have most of that resolved. And at this point, those are our COVID and respiratory disease updates. Uh, I'd like to see if either Dr. Rogers or Dr. Bridgers has anything they'd like to add um, from HHS. Nothing for me, Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, nothing for me either. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Dr. Stoddard. Nothing for me, so go ahead and the questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, members of the media. Questions regarding the public health update or any other general questions for the county executive and the team. Please raise your hand. Okay, there's Heather Curtis again, WMAL Radio. Good afternoon again, Heather, go ahead. Good afternoon again. Um, wondering, uh, County Executive, have you had any talks with different religious organizations about what's happening in Israel who have have voiced specific threats or have you know any concerns about specific threats or is it just in general people are concerned given what's happening over there I, I think um, nobody's mentioned a specific threat people are concerned that um, in the past that incidents in the Middle East have triggered uh, increases of hate violence in you know here in the United States in general probably around the world and I think there's um, an uncomfortable anticipation that we could be visited with this again so we would like to um, be prepared for it and not decide what we do after the fact and you talked about requ uh, requesting some money immediately for religious institutions yeah. feeling vulnerable, um, what would they be allowed to do with the money? Would there be restrictions or just whatever they feel they need to do? To we, we, we would have to talk about that. I think, you know, for a lot of people having um, somebody on site um, 
you know, as you know, there, as you know, if you go to some of our religious institutions, you'll find during times of uh, holidays or during religious services, there's often, you know, Montgomery County off-duty police or, you know, other security people, you know, at their facilities. So we, we see that now already. So I would imagine it probably along the same lines, but um, I have not had a specific request other than a general discussion with anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Members of the media, any other questions? For the county executive and the other government officials? No questions? All right, going once, twice. I guess we're done for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Stay safe. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.